Hey there, STEM enthusiasts! Welcome back to Cameron's Lab, Dive In, the go-to podcast for STEM students. Craft it with passion by one of your own. I'm Cameron, your enthusiastic and ever-curious host. Buckle up for today's insightful episode. Ready to dive in? Hi everyone, it's Cameron again. So today I'm here with Hannah Klaus. So she is a wonderful and amazing researcher in AI that I met over the summer. And I'm super excited to have her here with me today. So she's originally from, I believe, Germany, and she was studying at the University of Bedfordshire. Bedfordshire? Sorry. <laughs> Her UK accent is not very great. But she studied there first and then moved on to Queen Mary, here where we are, for her master's in AI. So Hannah, thank you so much for speaking with me. I'm really thank excited you. to have you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> thank you. Um, so if you could just start off, I guess, with what got you into AI? Like, it's such a big topic right now. So what got you started in it? I have to say, um, I, I started out with computer science. I had uh, my programming background. And then after going to university while still being in school, I realized that there's so much to computer science, so many different areas. You can go into cyber security. Uh, you can go into software development. And then to me, AI was just the, the golden, shiny thing uh, because everyone was starting to talk about it mm -hmm. and no one knew what it was and uh, it just kept on developing. Uh, we always had new things every single day and uh, to me that was just fascinating. I needed to be in a place where I knew it wouldn't be the same in 10 years and 20 years and 30 years. So yeah, that's how I got in there. Love that. I think that's the same for me for robotics. Yeah. I just love <laughs> this like everybody's into it, this like yeah. new technology, and nobody knows what it is, but exactly. if you do, you're just like super yeah. cool. <laughs> so, so, love that. Um, if I could ask a little bit about, I guess, before AI, what got you into computer science? Were you always into science and technology, or was it something else before? I That's actually a very good question, because I don't know. I just know that back in school, we were supposed to decide between like four different topics, and uh, computer science just seemed to be the best option out of like drama, Latin, Japanese. And then I thought, okay, I might as well try that, you know. Well. And apparently I was good at it. And I thought, okay, I might continue. And then, yeah, here I am <laughs> still <laughs> in AI, yeah. still doing all of this. So, But no, I honestly love science. I don't think I would be the same without it. Mm, totally agree. Um, if I could also ask you about, I suppose what you're doing now. So when I first met you, you were in your master's degree and you were yeah. being just a wonderful student, everyone. <laughs> just doing a lot of things at the time. And like you. <laughs> we try, we try. <laughs> um, but you were the, well, you, you still are the Deep Mind Scholarship Scholar. So if you could tell us about, I guess, what sparked you to do your master's in AI and then if you could talk about the language learning yeah. model that you were focusing on. So um, obviously because I started off with AI and robotics first mm -hmm. in my bachelor's, I, I felt like I already had the basics around uh, robotics mm -hmm. because it was very um, big during my bachelor's and I worked at the German Aerospace Center and I worked on a robot there. And I felt like, okay, three years of robotics is enough for now. <laughs> and I could go into natural language processing. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, it seemed like the uh, next big thing. And then, of course, ChatGPT happened. Yeah. And it was just perfect timing, really. So, yeah, that's how I got into it. And then with DeepMind, I, I was just lucky enough to get the scholarship for them mm -hmm. to uh, sponsor my studies and... Also, you get a mentor, so you get introduced to DeepMind and the company, how they work. And it was just fascinating. And to have that guidance as well, it really helped me. Wonderful. And just so people understand a little bit more. So for the master's at Queen Mary for AI, there's three different streams, I believe you said. Yes. So if you yeah. could explain that a little bit for people. Exactly. So if you come to Queen Mary to study AI um, in your master's degree, you can choose between natural language processing uh, robotics with computer vision and then also I, I believe it's game design mm -hmm, cool. and um, obviously because I had already done robotics I mm -hmm. thought okay that, that I've done that <laughs> game design wasn't really right up my alley so I chose natural language processing very cool and I guess if I could ask you what you're doing with natural languages like natural language pro natural language processing yeah <laughs> now what are you doing with that today so um, I mean doing my Masters, I worked on my thesis on uh, creating a classifier, so a machine learning algorithm that can distinguish between positive and negative news. Mm -hmm. Because obviously during COVID, we were just bombarded with so many bad news. Mm -hmm. And I realized it was just not good for, you know, people's mental health. 
and uh, just being able to read good news. That that was my goal. So um, I tried to do that with AI because why not? Why not? <laughs> uh, and yeah, in the end, I built different uh, algorithms to see which ones work best. And uh, that's how I started out. Mm-hmm. And uh, now I'm working at the Ada Lovelace Institute. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they focus more on regulation and policy uh, around AI so that the AI that, uh, AI that we're currently building is built for everyone in society Mm. and not like a small group of very similar people Mm. so yeah Yeah. I love that I was actually that's a good segue into what else I want to talk to you about so um, if anybody else has seen for example like Dr. Joy's research into Mm. like the different racial biases in AI and also looking at like ethically sourcing your data sets Have you noticed anything like that within your own research? Yes, definitely. So, I mean, I did write a paper on uh, bias within facial recognition applications Mm -hmm. and how we can optimize uh, the algorithms. And um, now, even during my master's thesis, when I analyzed the data set, I I could see, so my data set was about uh, news articles because it was in news uh, from 2016 and 17. And because most of the articles are from the U.S., in 2016, there was the whole election with Trump and Obama, which meant everything about the news was, you know, about uh, politics. And that you only realize once you go deep into the data set mm-hmm. and really dig deep and try to uh, analyze the word similarities, which word comes up m- most often. And obviously it was like Trump, Obama and so on. So <laughs> you could already see that there was a bias uh, towards political news mm-hmm. and uh also, you know, whether it's a Republican or Democratic. And yeah, if you want to build a different application that looks at different things, then you don't need a political data set. True. Yeah. I guess if you could explain a bit more about, I guess, how you choose a data set. So how yeah. do you know like, if it's coming from the right space? Because I feel like what I've learned a lot in terms of like, trying to get into AI myself yeah. is that you it's difficult to know like how ethically sourced it is until you actually start looking deeper into the data set. Yeah. So you could explain, I guess, a high level for those of us that don't know, like me, <laughs> high level of how you source your data. Yeah, I think it's really complicated because uh, you don't have the resources to create your own data set. So you have to rely on other people's data sets and you don't know what methods they use. You don't know how they got to their data. You don't know who they asked to get all of this, uh, whether people actually gave their consent or not. And uh, that's why you really have to be careful with what you use. And even when I, uh, during my bachelor's, when I wrote a paper on the facial recognition, I realized during my, uh, during working on the uh, algorithms that the data set was, I think to like 70% made out of white men. And to me that just, I never realized that that could be an issue until I saw uh, the testing phase Mm -hmm. where women of color, for example, were just not recognized. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is, that felt also personal because, you know, we are both women of color. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mom, uh, she would not be part of the data set. And then I realized, okay, no, we have to change something about this. Mm -hmm. So if I had the resources, I would like to build my own data sets and be able to annotate them as well because it's so very biased at the moment and most of them are very Eurocentric as well. Very true. Yeah. I think what I've also noticed for myself is, like, as you said, we're both women of color, like my mom and everything. Whenever we start learning about all this technology, yeah. you, you kind of realize just how underrepresented we are. Yes. Like you think the things have changed, but it, no. it actually quite <laughs> hasn't. If you look a little deeper, you're like, Wait a second, that's that's not exactly. at all representative of And us. you would think people would notice. That's and what I they, don't. As well. they don't. Like if you I don't know how much you've seen around the open AI business, mm. um, but the fact that now the whole board and all the people in power basically are all white men yeah. and they did not realise that when they made all these decisions, that just blows my mind. <laughs> Uh, to think that they did not stop and think about what kind of image that that, mm-hmm. that would show and uh, what kind of message that was uh, going to go into the world. So, yeah. yeah, we really have to do something. That's why we're here. I agree. Which is why I'm so glad we have people like yeah. yourself who are working <laughs> at AI. <laughs> Which is so exciting. Um, so, I, what I wanted to ask you next was about your work at the Ada Lovelace Institute. So, if you could talk to us about maybe if that has any link or if there's any impact that you feel like you've been able to make mm-hmm. as a woman of color working yeah. there. So the reason why I applied to get there is uh, because during my studies, I I had a very like 
technical background, so mm. everything I did was very technical, whether it was in AI, robotics, or natural language processing. And I realized that we never really learn about all the ethical implications that come into building these kinds of technologies. And we don't know anything about the impact this will have on different societies, mm. uh, people like us, people who are not like us. And uh, I thought that was just very sad to see that we didn't have that as part of a curriculum. Mm -hmm. And even if we have lectures on this, then it's mostly about GDPR mm -hmm. and that's it. And I don't think that's enough. There's so much more that we have to talk about. So mm -hmm. I realized that I needed this knowledge as well. And um, there was a position as a research assistant uh, to work on policy and regulations within AI. And I thought, okay, maybe they need someone with a more technical background because most of them come from a humanities background. And yeah, and now it's amazing, honestly, talking to all these people who have different backgrounds, but also work in AI and give me so many different perspectives that I never even thought to uh, think about. So. Yeah, it's truly amazing to work with people like uh, them and uh, to go to different events, uh, talk to governments as well. And yeah, to see that we can build something that can be good for everyone. Mm. That's wonderful. Especially, yeah. I think, representation and just showing yes. up and actually having someone there to represent yeah. is so important and it makes such a big difference. Exactly. Um, I want to ask if, for, for example, if your language models and things that you've seen, have you noticed things with, I suppose, like different accents or slang that maybe one person would use and another person would it? How, wouldn't? Sorry, but how would the AI, I suppose, deal with that? Would you yeah. if you've noticed anything like that? I think the main problem in this case is really that we don't have enough data for uh, all languages in the world. Mm -hmm. So most of the data set is English, mm -hmm. of course, and then we have uh, Chinese, I believe, uh, and then we go into other big languages but that's about it so you know there are so many other languages out there in the world there are some countries who have within their country already 70 80 different languages wow. and for example my mother's from Ethiopia which means there we have 70 80 uh, different languages and it's not just uh, dialect it's not just slang it is actual different languages mm -hmm. and they have different alphabets as well which means we can't use the same alphabet we use in the english language mm -hmm. and uh, this data is just not there when you want to build these kinds of language models mm -hmm. and there is no one who points that out because the people who build these kinds of models they they mostly are from you know european backgrounds mm -hmm. and uh, that's why we really have to work on this first to get all this data then to get a diverse a group of people who work on this and then also we need to test it. So if you look at ChatGPT, mm -hmm. if you try to use ChatGPT uh, with underrepresented languages, it's not going to work properly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so okay. that's what we have to build. Okay. If you could also explain, I guess, back, going back off of that, I guess, lack of representation in the different big businesses like OpenAI, Facebook, Google that are doing all these big things. Yeah. How would you guess, I guess, if you were to give your own recommendations on what companies can do to change, to kind of become a little bit more ethical, what would you, I mean, would you say? The, the I'm sure the list thing. is long. Yeah, like the easiest thing is really to hire us. Um, fact, fact. But I think the main thing is really to think about what kind of society do they want to have in the future. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, for example, the growth within population, mm -hmm. Africa, South America, Asia, they have such a growth spurt within their population and Europe is just shrinking. <laughs> so right now, Europe is building applications within AI um, that are very uh, concentrated on Europe's usage. Mm -hmm. But the people that are going to use these kinds of technologies, they're mostly in Africa, South America, Asia. But these technologies are not built for these kinds of people. Mm -hmm. So um, right now we are building AI that is not really sustainable. And I think the, the best thing that they can do is to integrate um, more diverse groups of people, mm -hmm. to really go into each country and um, create a new standard of education to really help people to get into this and have not this disparity between you know, uh, Europe and um, Africa, for example, because there's so much talent, there's so much potential and people, uh, they're amazing. And they just don't have the same resources. They don't have the same access, which means that they get left out and they're behind, which it just does not make sense because they have the right to be part of this whole discussion. 
So yeah, include people. Yeah. And that's that's the first step really. I think that's really good advice. If for example, for yourself, if you wanted to start thinking about how you can, I think you well, you did mention wanting to build your own data model. So yeah. if you were to do something like that, how would you want to start that? Is that something like, just because I personally wouldn't mm -hmm. know where to yeah. start with that. Is that more something where you would go out to these other countries and have to talk to people about it? Yeah. Or like, how would that kind of work? A yeah. high level, obviously not, not to a detail, but just a high I level. I mean, level. first of all, you need money. Uh, you need resources. Yeah. Uh, so you can do all of this. But I would love to go out and talk to researchers from different countries um, to create a data set that is really um, equal mm -hmm. in, uh, in the way it is built, uh, but also in the amount of data you have there, so that you have the same amount of maybe English uh, text as, uh, let's say, Nigerian text, mm -hmm. uh, Ethiopian text, um, text from India, text from China, whatever. But at least you have the same amount so that the models that you build are not already too biased because there will be bias anyways i don't think uh, we are able to completely eliminate bias <laughs> it's always going to be there but on the other hand we can make sure that we can control the bias and that we can uh you know eliminate the small biases that um, that are unnecessary really and that just come from our ignorance so yeah we would need resources and definitely people that can help us out on that because I don't speak Spanish, I don't speak um, French, uh, I don't speak that many uh, languages, although I do speak French, yeah. Oh, well. But um, <laughs> it just means that I wouldn't be able to see whether that is actually correct data. I wouldn't be able to test it. Um, so if I were to go to China, I have no idea if the data set is good and accurate uh, or not. So you would need someone from there. Because that's again bringing us back to representation once again. Exactly. So it's just Highlighting again why it's yeah. so important. <laughs> um, I guess if I could ask you again, if I suppose what would be the good kind of things, the, the good news, what is anything that you would say your research has led to in a positive kind of impact? Mm. Is there anything that you've noticed so far? I mean, the, I mean, my research hasn't really gone that far because mostly I worked on different yet. models. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Uh, and different models that could uh, distinguish between positive and negative news. So mm -hmm. I did not create a user interface for people to work with. But in general, during my research, I realized that, you know, sometimes you just need positive news. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you remember, but during COVID, uh, there were some people that tried to, like, have these good news channels, uh, mm -hmm. good news publishing, yeah. um, to just say, okay, this neighbor helped this neighbor out, um, or this person found a new cure, or something small, yeah, something but small. still something that would make you smile. Mm -hmm. And I think this is so important, especially now when there's so much going on, and uh, people are sometimes fearing for their life, um, They and they spiral, mm -hmm. and it's good to have something positive to bring them back. So. I hope I can make a difference, and uh, yeah, I mean, you're already doing something, so uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying to, trying to. Um, I feel like I really love that idea of just making it a bit more positive. I feel like we all need yeah. a little bit of sunshine in our lives, definitely. at least right now. Definitely. Yeah, especially in winter. <laughs> yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Go to your mention. What else I wanted to ask you was about, I suppose, what else you're doing so outside of your research at the mm. Ada Lovelace Institute? Is there anything else you've been doing? So I know that you go to a lot of conferences, you do a lot of volunteering. Yeah. So you can tell us <laughs> more about all the other so good things. So I, uh, yeah, I'm a member of various organizations. Um, so that counts women in AI, black women in AI, women in AI robotics, yeah. we and AI. <laughs> um, as you can tell, they're all very, like, they're very connected to AI. Mm. And, uh, to me, it's just very important to be part of these organizations because they work on, um, yeah, helping with representation in AI mm. and being able to make a difference that actually it, you can see the difference as well. So, for example, in Black Women in AI, when I first joined their meetings, mm. it was just, obviously it was online back in COVID, but it was just a Zoom meeting full of black woman in AI oh, and to that. me that was just the most amazing thing because you know when I started out with AI or just computer science in general I was the only girl with 20 boys yeah. and because I was in Germany all of them were white as well mm -hmm. so I wasn't just the only girl I was the only person of color too yeah. and then once I got to uni I was still 
in the minority when it came to, you know, uh, whether it was my heritage or the fact that I was a woman. And um, now I can slowly see the change, very slowly, um, but at least I can see a change. And when I then go to these, kind, these kinds of uh, conferences, when I go to uh, meetings with these uh, amazing organizations, I can see that we are supporting each other. We are really rooting for each other. And um, there are so many talented people mm. and they just don't get the same recognition as, you know, um, white men in AI. And um, that's why we're here to change that, really. Mm. And that, yeah, we just need more people and we need more role models. We need to get the word out. We need to show people that, you know, um, they can go into this. Like mm. right now, I would have loved to see people like us uh, yeah. when I was younger to know that there are people exactly. like me yeah. and that I can go into this. I'm not crazy. Um, so, yeah, I hope with this we can actually motivate younger people to join us. Exactly. Yeah. whole point of the podcast, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's really just to increase representation. So I, I yes. love what you said. It's very encouraging to know that there's actual organizations out there yes. where you can find people that look like you and they're doing what you want to do. And I just, oh, yeah. that's so amazing. I exactly. love that so much. Yeah. And we have workshops. We have talks. I've given some workshops as well because I think it's so important to, you know, share your knowledge and mm -hmm. skills because, like, not everyone has access to the same kinds of resources. And if you can share what you've learned um, with everyone else, I think this is the most important thing, really. We can't build things for ourselves. We can't build a future for ourselves if we don't share our knowledge. Mm -hmm. And um, then there's organizations like We're in AI. We... We try to raise awareness on AI literacy. The fact that you know everyone in society still thinks about AI as oh my god, Terminator's coming, yeah. and oh my god, the world is ending. Um, and the fact is, it's not like that. Yeah. And um, we can do so many positive things with it, but the media only talks about all the negative things. So yeah, we try to you know um, make people aware about uh, what AI is and what kind of potential it has. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you wouldn't mind just explaining a little bit more about what kind of, I guess, positive things that you've seen AI be used for. Because I feel like, like you said, there's not enough positive examples and most of them are negative. It's like, oh, yeah. chat GPT or this, this language model yeah. got him to try to leave his wife or something else went crazy wrong. Oh my just, God, yeah. Anything, it's... anything, I guess, a bit more positive that you've maybe seen, even not in your own research. Yeah, just it's, right. I mean, I can see it so many places it, mm. it's already helping us mm. and i don't think people realize where it is already <laughs> and um it's now that i think about it positive things <laughs> um <laughs> i think when it comes to in general translating mm -hmm. um making knowledge more accessible so even if it's chat or even if you're using google search mm. um you'll be able to get more knowledge, more skills, just by looking at this, YouTube, all the algorithms in there. Um, all this open knowledge, all this open sharing of things uh, worldwide, and the fact that you can access to this uh, for free. I mean, you kind of share that's your data sure. with them, but yeah, that's the pact. But at least you get all this access, and it is tailored to you. It is personalized. And um, then, obviously, when you go into health, there, there yeah. is so much being done. Mm -hmm. uh, it, yeah, we would still sit here tomorrow if I start counting up everything. <laughs> and there's, for example, people that um, struggle with mental health. Mm -hmm. um, then there's people who have disabilities, um, you know, and it's easier for AI to help them with directions uh, or when they use the internet and everything. And it's, you have so many different applications in every sector, mm -hmm. uh, in every part of society. And yeah, if we keep building things like this that can actually help people and you can see the impact it has, uh, yeah, that would be amazing. We don't need a Terminator. 100%. Yeah. Um, I really like this like thought of how, I guess, impactful AI has become. I feel like mm -hmm. most people think, when you think AI, you automatically think things like ChatGPT and then yeah. that's like the surface of it all, but there's so much more underneath, like yes. you said, so that's really wonderful. Yeah, because AI is not this... I don't know. I feel like to people it's just a concept and uh, it is just Terminator in their eyes uh, or hell, you know. And uh, in in the end, it's literally just algorithms that can learn and uh, learn from historical data or even from current data. And then they just see patterns and continue with that. So in the end, 
it's everywhere <laughs> and uh, it, it's really helping us out. But we need to be careful uh, yeah. which kind of data we're using. Um, if the data we're using, you know, if people actually said yes to that and also what happens to children True. and yeah. So yeah, there are lots of things to talk about and think about. That's why that's what I currently do at my work. Yeah. And um, yeah, we need more people in that area as well. I agree. Yeah. I think what I'm kind of noticing in terms of like what you're saying, a little bit of a pattern of where AI is bringing us really close together, but then I guess some of the different ways that we're sourcing data or the people that are kind of building these models is also slightly bring, well, not maybe slightly, but also like bringing us apart at the same time. It's almost like like a magnet. Like if you have them on the opposite side yes. and they're constantly like repulsing each yeah. other, like you're getting closer, yeah. but like it's still yeah. something in the middle that makes that little it's, block. It's really hard because, you know, everyone has their own ideas mm -hmm. and what, you know, they can. Um, but then you have these very influential people that uh, have very loud voices uh, and they share their insights. Um, but... You know, sometimes it's very uh, dangerous to just believe the first thing that you hear, uh, believe the first thing that you read, because you don't know the facts. You, you have to question everything in this case. So it's, um, yeah, even if you read books about this, uh, if you watch interviews, if you listen to lectures, be aware that everyone shares their um, very subjective views on this as well. So, um, yeah, if we want to work in AI, we need to make sure that we have a diverse uh, the group with different perspectives as well. So not just where people come from, but also what their roles were before. What did they study? Um, what is their socioeconomic background and so on? We need so many different uh, perspectives. So, yeah. And what would you recommend for people that don't have a background in AI, but they want to get involved in it a little bit more? How would you yeah. recommend that they... I suppose, well, first of all, I'm going to ask yeah. a couple of questions about this, but how would you say that they can, I guess, protect themselves when they're trying to get involved? So maybe if they're thinking, oh, I want to be a part of this training model, but you're yeah. not sure, like, how would they navigate getting involved in that sense first? Yeah. I have to say, if you have a different background and want to get into AI, this is your asset, mm -hmm. really. It is so amazing to have this extra background because you'll be able to have two sides uh, of your knowledge so you will learn all this knowledge about AI mm. but also you have your previous knowledge and this will really come in handy later on because there will be applications where you need people with expertise from you know a domain mm. and also people who know about AI because you need to be able to understand both sides so if you want to get into AI and you have a different background do it mm. because uh, you'll have lots to do in the future. And yeah, if you want to become training, uh, part of you know, training, testing phase within AI, uh, just be aware of what they're asking you to do and uh, read everything about it. Uh, maybe look up the people that work for it. Uh, what is their intention with this? You know, um, maybe you think, okay, this is just for a car and whether they recognize you on the street. Uh, but then later on, it will be used for military um, purposes. And then, yeah, just just be aware. Um, but also, we need the data. True. And if you're not part of the data set and people like us, then, yeah, we won't be recognized. And, yeah, so we really have to think about it. It's a scary thought that you say we won't be recognized. It's so true. If you're not included yeah. in the data set, then you won't be recognized exactly. by the model. Which is, yeah. Well, it's a bit of a thought. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It also sounds like you're in AI, at least, your uniqueness is also what gives you a little bit of a strength. So I think that's really good as well yeah. to think about. So, definitely. Yeah. But I really hope it's not going to stay like this forever. Yeah, definitely. We need, oh, I want to have like you know, my own army of people that, you know, look like us just so we can uh, fight back and, you know, change a bit within this space. Love that, That's really good. Um, what I wanted to go into next was just kind of going back to, I suppose, your own advice for other students. So yeah. I like to ask the question just like if you were giving advice to your younger self, but I guess for yourself, if you were giving advice to other students yeah. who want to get involved in AI, maybe they're already studying in university, like they're super mm. into robotics like yeah. you are, yeah. or they're in computer science or things like that, or even not. Sometimes people yeah. want to switch over from like medicine and business. Yeah. I mean, the first thing is really do it. Mm -hmm. uh, just go for it because it, AI is going to be everywhere, I think. Um, it is already, uh, but it's going to be more dominant and uh, we need 
people with different domain expertise <laughs> that can help out. So, for example, me with just my AI, just my AI <laughs> knowledge, um, I wouldn't know the exact things in med uh, medicine, for example, <laughs> which means I would have to talk to an expert within medicine. But if there's already someone who is an expert within medicine but also knows about AI, <laughs> then this is going to be so helpful uh, in building new models for these kinds of cases um, to be very specific and be able to look at it from different sides, then we definitely need people with a humanities background to think about society and what kind of impact does AI have on society. And in general, if, if you're thinking about getting into AI, you, you'll definitely get a job. <laughs> um, there, there are lots of applications, there's lots going on, um, so your, your future is safe. Um, and also, you, your CV will be unique because you'll have two different backgrounds already. So you'll have AI and your other expertise. And I think this will really come in handy. So yeah, just, just go for it. It is tough because right now everyone is in it and there's this hype and we don't know if this is going to stay on forever or if this is going to stop in five years because people say, oh no, now we're interested in something else. So um, yeah, you, you just have to think about if you're really interested in this. Uh, but there's so many different applications, so many different things to do. So yeah, I, I can only recommend it. Love that. And I guess I want to bring it a little bit back to the nerdier side of things, just because yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's how we got started in this little friendship going. Yeah. <laughs> um, when I first met you, I had asked about the like why you chose language as yeah. your focus in AI. If you could explain a little bit more about that. Yeah. What made you pick language over, I guess, computer vision or something yeah. like that? I mean, so, for example, when I started out with AI and robotics, mm -hmm. I, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. So uh, <laughs> when in episode one, when Anakin starts working on C-3PO, to me, that was just that big moment where I realized, wow, that's what I want to do too. Like, I want to build my own robot, but also one that can move and talk like a human being. And that was just fascinating to me. And I was younger, of course. Uh, and then I realized, okay, uh, what steps do I need to take in order to get there to build my own C-3PO? And um, so that's why I started out with AI and robotics and I got my robotics in and I got to work on different robots that would go to space. So I had done that, you know, and then I thought, OK, what's the next step? So I did robotics. Now I can go into language because I also want to have something that can generate language that could, that I could talk to, you know, like a, like an assistant. Or, for example, when you go into Avengers with Jarvis, <sighs> Yeah, I, <laughs> exactly. So I realized that's what I wanted to go into next. And uh, there was just so much potential. And the fact that it's language, mm -hmm. we speak it every day. And um, I am also a huge reader. So mm -hmm. to me, uh, the words uh, had such a different meaning than just, you know, being able to talk about it. it it's poetry, it's art, it's literature. And um, if you can combine this with AI as well, yeah, there is so much out there. So um, I started with that because I was just so fascinated by it. And the fact that you can build something that can generate text out of <laughs> thin air, basically, it, yeah, it still blows my mind, honestly. Yes, when I look at ChatGPT, I'm just amazed. I'm, I just, I still can't believe it. Yeah. And it just shows the power of science and the power of AI and how much we have yet to accomplish. Like if, if it's like this right now, then imagine what we can manage in 10 years. So yeah, honestly, I cannot wait. So yeah, I, I just had to do this. <laughs> yeah. I think if I could also just kind of, because it sounds like when you're having these big dreams, like you read all yeah. these cool science books and you yeah. get into the movies when you're younger, um, when you move on to these other bigger dreams. So I'm also wanted to link it into your time at MIT a little bit. So I heard yes. that you spent the summer there, which yeah. is just amazing. That's every, <laughs> every tech person's dream is to go to MIT and you achieved it. So yeah. I'm, we have to talk about that. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's uh, true. I, yeah, so this summer, I thought I was just going to use it to travel, mm. but also to travel in the name of AI and of science, because 
yeah, what else am I going to do? <laughs> and I did have to write my master's thesis as well and oh. do my exams, but I thought, I only had the summer once. So, um, yeah. Super woman. I, <laughs> exactly. I just applied to different summer schools. And to anyone out there, I can definitely recommend doing that. Mm -hmm. You get to meet other people, like-minded people, uh, but also who have different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You come from all over the world to just be together there for a week or two. Uh, then you have different people, uh, professors also coming from all over the world, giving lectures. Then you have labs. It's... It's just a very interesting phase because it's not quite like university, you know. Um, you are there with people that you didn't know before and it's very specific topics. And you're only there for a short amount of time. But this amount of time is so concentrated with mm. knowledge and with people that just want to discuss everything around this. And um, yeah, you get to see different cities. Mm. So I went to Slovakia, I went to Oxford, mm. I uh, went to MIT. Um, and that was just mind blowing to me that I could get into these kinds of things uh, just because of all the work that I've done before. And um, if you had told me this 10 years ago, I would have laughed. Even five years ago, I would have said, no way. And the fact that I got to be there, even if it was just for a short amount of time, it really manifested my dreams. And the fact that, you know, if you work hard enough, if you really do what you want to do mm. as well, something that really drives you passionately, then you can get wherever you want to. Love that. Yeah. This seems like technology. As soon as you get into it, it just propels you to like a completely yeah. different universe and you just, you wouldn't expect it. And it's, it's just so exactly. cool to listen to everyone's But there are so many opportunities out there, so yeah. many different summer schools as well. Mm. And they happen all over, all over the world with different universities and, it's the best experience, really. Yeah. Thank you very much. I guess for the last little bit, if you could give us a little bit of, I guess, closing words, any yeah. advice that you have for us, because we're all really excited to have you. At least I'm super excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, any advice I can give is if you, if there's something that you really want, go for it. Mm. Um, there will be lots of people that will tell you, oh, you're in the wrong room, you're yeah. in the wrong place, <laughs> oh, why are you doing this? Uh, who question you? Don't. Mm. Don't let that uh, keep you from what you actually want to do. Like when I think back to all the different comments I got, the fact that I was the only girl in the room, you know, people saying, oh, woman in technology, that will never work out. Or what are you going to do anyways? It, it really got to my heart mm -hmm. when I was younger. And I thought maybe this is wrong. Maybe I'm not supposed to be here because I grew up thinking, oh, I'm supposed to go into language or art or whatever. Mm. And I realized that wasn't for me. And no one prepared me for this kind of rebellion <laughs> against societal standards. And I had to fight my way through it. And, you know, I, I still am. And so are probably you and every other person <laughs> out there who has probably our background. And go go for it. Uh, mm. Fight fight your way through it because it's worth it. And you know, the fact that we both can sit here right now to talk about these things, <laughs> it's just, it just shows you that um, all this work was worth it and that you can, you can do anything you want to. So uh, there are people like you out there. There are people like me out there and uh, we'll find each other and we can support each other. We can celebrate each other. Honestly, yeah. celebrating each other is the most important thing. Okay. If you have people around you that are happy for all your achievements and that support you in any way, yeah. uh, if you join these kinds of um, organizations, these kinds of communities yeah. where people really like to share their celebrations, their achievements, that's, I think, the best thing you can do because that will just keep you going, keep you fighting, and you'll know you're not on your own. Yeah. So, yeah, that's really the advice. That's great. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time, Hannah. Hope thank you all you enjoyed everything. Me. I really enjoyed the time. So thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. This thank was you. amazing. <laughs> okay. Hi again, awesome listener. That wraps up another deep dive of Cameron's Lab Dive In. Before you dive back into your day, see what I did there? Take a second to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. Want a behind the scenes look? Bonus content? Or just some good old STEM fun? Follow me on my socials. Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Cameron's Lab. And remember, every episode is a new adventure, and we've got some really dives lined up for you. Don't miss out! Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring.